Hi there, I'm Deep Dylan. Welcome to your AI Injection, the podcast where we discuss state-of-the-art techniques and in artificial intelligence with a focus on how these capabilities are used to transform organizations, making them more efficient, impactful, and successful. This week, our guest is somebody I'm really excited about. Pinder Van Arman. Pinder is an award-winning artist who uses AI to paint. So what does it mean to use AI to paint? I'm going to just talk about what I'm seeing right now. So I'm seeing robotic arms that have paintbrushes on them. And then the arm basically grabs some paint and starts putting paint to canvas. And typically the robot's got a camera on it and is making incremental decisions based on things that it's seeing. And so the result is just uh, amazing. So many of you, you know, probably know about style transfer techniques um, or these um, generative adversarial networks that are quite popular, but to actually see it in paint, kind of dripping in all their color and vibrancy is truly taking it to the next level. We're not just looking at it, you know, in pixels on the screen. Tell us a little bit about, you know, how, how did this happen? Like, were you a painter before? What's that evolution? Yeah, no, I was, I was an artist, always been an artist, but I always think that everyone's an artist. And I was painting and I, and I, um, I've always painted and I was selling work on eBay, you know, uh, that's just selling work. This is the only way I could figure out how to sell work. And it was actually kind of fun. And then I got involved in robotics um, in, the, in the DARPA Grand Challenge, which was a, uh, a contest held by DARPA to like, you know, make a self-driving car. Oh, cool. And, I didn't realize and I you were involved in that. Okay. Oh yeah, back in 2005. So you're familiar with it. Oh I'm yeah, yeah, for sure. sure. Are. So did you get a car together with a group and like Yeah. Uh... Uh, we did pretty well. So we got a group of 12 guys together, uh, guys and girls together and and it was Team Ensco and and we went to uh, both the first and the second and then it, with we joined Team Case for the third. Uh, the first one we like we hit a bank and like we're out at um like, like a couple hundred feet. It was horrible. Second one, our car drove 82 miles and we had the fastest time at the split time when we, something went wrong and we, we went off road and hit a, I don't want to, it actually made one of our team members very sad. Uh, we hit a Joshua tree and then it sort of wow. took out our wheels. And, um, and then the, the third one was, you know, it was, it was much more structured, but uh, you know, the, the one that I was most involved in was the second one. And it was, it was a race in desert. It was like one of those things you'll never forget, but you know, I got home and I was just so into AI yeah, and like, yeah. I was like all the things that could happen with the possibilities where I was sure that everyone would have self-driving cars in a couple of years. Uh, but I wanted to keep on doing work with AI, but I didn't have the money or the, the, the time or the expertise to make a self-driving car. Right. So I started looking around at like personal things I could do. I was like, oh, I'm just gonna, and I was like, I'm just gonna make uh I'm going to make myself a painting assistant, like a, a super smart printer. Yeah. And um, yeah. at the time, you know, I had a job, I had a growing family and, um, but painting, you know, even though I was selling an eBay, it'd take up the whole eight hours, 12 hours on a weekend. And I was like, oh man, it'd be so much cooler if I had a, a very intelligent printer that would actually wield a paintbrush and paint most of the painting for me and then leave me the last hour, you know, turn my 12 hour task into a one hour task. I was like, then I could do a painting every night. You know, this was going on in my head. Yeah. And so yeah. I started building painting robots. So I would have assistant that like, you know, would do the tedious work uh, and then leave the creative work for me. And I would just like, you know, just walk in, do the hour of art direction, be done with the painting. That's, that was the fantasy. Uh, I love it. So I you know, kind of started off with this efficiency goal in mind. And I'm, I'm curious, like, what's the, what was the boring part of the paintings to you, you know, back then or when you, yeah, when you thought question. about them? I, I do a lot of portraiture and to uh -huh. do a portrait, right? You have to get the proportions perfect. And I always thought it was like, you know, I, I do plenty of cheating, but one of the things you have to do is you either got to get a projector, yeah. or you got to put a grid down, you know, and like, or you have to be really skilled, which I'm not. Uh, you know, like, you know, you see some savant uh, portrait artists, they just like, look at you once, close their eyes, go into another room and repaint you. I can't do that. I, I would have to like, 
get their proportions right, spend a lot of time uh, getting everything just perfect. It's just, it, it's a robot gets proportions perfect and would lay down the eyes in the right place, the nose in the right place, the mouth in the right place, you know, when I was doing a portrait, then I would just go in and add the finesse. And so it would do the very difficult, yeah. boring. I mean, let, let's talk about, cause you talk about, you talked, you, you know, kind of, you said, well, I cheated. And, you know, a lot of people have that perception, but the truth is like, you know, going way back, um, you know, there's a lot of pretty well-known renowned artists that use like the camera obscura back yeah, in the old course. days to like paint yeah. off of, because, once you've done a you know a portrait the you know the painful way from scratch it 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 can feel you know pained to do that you know over and over again or you can be like my wife who you know does portraits all day and she's you know maybe not quite the savant you pictured but pretty close to it <laughs> and uh, and you know for her it's all like terrible to like to cut a corner on anything but I'm I'm curious like how do you think about like what does that even mean anymore like cheating because clearly people have to be asking you like, what does it mean for you to get robots to paint? And, you know, like what's the line of the artist and what, you know, and when do you cross it? I mean, clearly you, you're comfortable crossing whatever other people's lines yeah. are, but like, what's your line? And, and it would be cheating. It would be cheating. Deep if I, if I was to use, if I was to make these paintings and then not tell people there was a robot involved. Sure. I think that would be cheating. Like if you're an artist and you present yourself as more skilled than you actually are, you're cheating. Now, of course, you know, I have a, a, my secret advantage of is, is that when I tell people how I'm cheating, it's, it's actually more impressive than if I wasn't cheating, you know? Well, so, it's part of that. It is the art, right? Like so much yeah. of it, it, that so much of it is fundamental to interpretation of your work. Um, yeah. You have to know that there's a robot working with me. Otherwise it's one tenth is interesting. So the disclosure so. parts, it, it, it makes sense to me, but there's like, walk me through, like, cause I started thinking a little bit about how your machine must work, but I, I realized for our listeners benefit, maybe walk us through a time uh, sequence of everything that happens from subject matter selection to like, what is the bot looking at? Like, are, are they looking mm. at a photo mm. or, or are they looking at an actual subject? And then to like, you know, then it, it, it generates an a priori like concept image or something. And mm. then, and then it, you're in a feedback loop, everything from like how you dip the, the, how the bot chooses to dip the brush in the paint and to yeah. the brush selection. Like just walk us through that. Like, you know, like, like how that is and maybe wherever there are some forks in the road, you know, Okay. Okay. I, I always, I always wish I was more, I'm going to try and be concise because I can babble on, on and on, but um, <clears throat> this, the, the algorithm that runs my robot and I, I don't typically don't name my robots. I just name the project. And right now I'm naming the project autonomous Okay, is, is as much, I'm trying to program the robot to be as creative and autonomous as possible. It's not an artist because, you know, it won't be an artist until it's a person. No robot will be an artist until it's a person or, you know, has an identity and, and self-awareness. But, but I think creativity is possible. So this is 20, uh, it's 15 years of many, many, many AI algorithms put together. And, and the fundamental thing that's happening with my robot is, is feedback loops. And, and the feedback loop is, you got to think of it in the terms of an artist, not just in terms of, um, it sounds like a computer science term, but I first heard of it from artist Paul Clay. And, and Paul Clay said, like, you know, every artist, when they, he said every painter, when they create paintings, is in a feedback loop. They step to the canvas, make a couple brush strokes, take a step back, analyze those brush strokes, and use that as feedback on how to make the next brush strokes. And they make more brush strokes, and they take a step back. How do they come out? And, they, and it's back and forth. And they have these feedback loops every brush stroke, every thousand brush strokes. And they might, you know, halfway through a canvas might step back and have a different, a higher level feedback loop. How's this whole thing? So it's, I think what's really important to like really achieve AI is to not run an algorithm and let that algorithm um, do its thing. It's to like run many, many, many small algorithms and try and analyze how those algorithms are working and here's where I'll get into a little more detail. So that's the framework. Oh. I, I, I want to just kind of jump in there for a second, because I think that's there, there's like an in, in interesting distinction right right off the bat here. Not everyone is doing the same thing when they take a step back and look at their canvas. Yes. And the amount of time and the thought process and maybe even some socialization that goes on when you step back can vary, you know, like, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I paint a fair amount myself and I know like, you know, my wife and I are both, are, are both painters and we've, you know, we've done some residencies around and 
we've always had this like this rule where someone else can yank the canvas away <laughs> from the other person. Oh. Just because, you know, you will like step back and overpaint sometimes. Yes. Just bork something. And paintings, mm -hmm. like I, I think painters can sort of appreciate this, that paintings are not just at all about the finished product. Like there's an entire process and evolution and many paint, for every painting that winds up being perfect, I would argue there's, I don't know, five or 10 or maybe even 50 failed paintings along the way. <laughs> or, yeah. And sometimes potentially amazing paintings that got painted over and got 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 torqued off. I just throw that out there to just kind of like just sort of sort of throw out the question like what are you doing when you're stepping back? You know, like because that's actually a very big question. Because sometimes you're thinking something technical. Some artists, you know, have like a thing they're trying to get to and they're trying to steer. Other mm -hmm. artists totally reject that notion of trying to get to a destination that's a priori determined and go mm -hmm. and kind of follow where the work's going and seeing it as a duality. I'm curious, like for you, how are you thinking about that part? You know, that part from the robots vantage. And I, I can tell you're a painter and you're a painter a very, I, I don't know how similar you are to me in painting, but I mean, I could, I totally feel what you're saying. It's like uh, when you step back, you never know what the reason is. And also, I don't know. One thing I say, I'll, I'll just jump into this and I'll jump back into your question is like, yeah, I always think to myself, you know, like I, I love that, that you and, uh, and your wife can pull paintings away from each other. Cause sometimes people ask me like, you know, what's the hardest algorithm is the most difficult algorithm. I, if I could write this algorithm, it'd be great. Cause there's so many times the robots painting way. I was like, that looks great. I should stop it. But then I don't stop it and it destroys something. And I was like, the greatest algorithm is uh, if this robot can just decide when the painting is done. Cause yeah. it doesn't ultimately I'm the person that decides when the painting is done and, uh, it's, and decides. It's gotta it's be one of the done. hardest things. And it's one of the hardest things for the artist. I feel like it's very easy for me to yank other friends of mine's paintings off and be like, you gotta leave this thing alone. Like I have no problem doing it for someone else's piece, but for my own, there's just this temptation to just keep going and keep going yeah. until it's all brown and ugly and you gotta start over. Yeah, no, and then you, you know, like we're spoiled with, con, you know, uh, what do you call it? Control Z or like using Photoshop. We just wanna undo, but there's no undoing, you know. There's no undoing because you're talking about physical paint you got to just keep going. <laughs> yeah. You're listening to your AI injection brought to you by Zionix.com. That's X-Y-O-N-I-X.com. Check out our website for more content or if you need help injecting AI into your organization. Here's, here's where I got inspired by like, I love it that you're mentioning is like a bunch of different um people do different things when they, when they sit back with the feedback loop and technical aspect, maybe someone is like trying to find, you know, follow a very exact line. So they're, they've gone all technical in their brain. I just have to follow this line and get their proportions right. And in another level, someone's just taking a step back and saying, is there enough contrast? You know, yeah. another person might take a step back and saying, are the colors, um, you know, complementary of each other. Okay. So there's all these different things. And, and it's funny how this is, how I approach it is I, like I was saying, there's about 24, two dozen, a couple more, a couple less. It changes algorithms that whenever it takes a step back, they all start working and, um, and they all give themselves scores. And, and then, you know, and like, what you know, are they? What, what, tell, tell me what those 24 you, algorithms are. Or... I'll tell you a bunch of them. One is, um, one is, is there a contrast? It just does a quick contrast read.
factory and some of this uh, some of the ai is very very sophisticated and other it's just like uh you know i fudge a lot of numbers uh -huh. but they have a confidence is like i want to change this area and i'm confident that i want to change this area that for i'll give you the simplest example the one that that looks for contrast it says this area has horrible contrast and i'm very confident right and then and then um and then it'll it'll just scream add contrast to this area um and in the in the and with a high with a 95 percent certainty i need to do this right and then that might win out because if nothing else is certain of what to do like okay let's go add contrast and what's cool about this uh, deep is not only do i um have these i have weights i've like imagine 24 levers where when I'm making a painting, I might say, ignore the contrast. And I will take that lever and turn contrast down and say, I don't care how loud contrast is screaming. The loudest it can scream is 10%, you know? So and are so you like there? A, like when these decisions are being oh, yeah. made and can you intercede? Like according to your own personal rule set, so you, you do. And are yeah. you kind of approving on a each brushstroke basis or are you letting it run for a set of brushstrokes or are you messing around with that? That. more directorial more like i'll let it go for a couple hours and like you i come back and look at the painting is like is it going the direction i want and then i'll be like oh my gosh um like turn on oh i might be like it's so boring uh i'm gonna really go tell the gan the, the generative adversarial network to to like just i'll turn everything else down and turn the generative adversarial network up to look at the thing and then start recalculating faces and try and generate a new face find a new face and start painting a new face, you know, and, and I'll turn everything down, but the GAN, so the GAN runs. Or, or if the colors are really boring, I might say, I need more complementary colors and I'll turn everything down, but the complementary colors, stuff like that. I mean, that's funny. Cause isn't that, that's kind of what I feel like I do when I'm painting. There's like, so, sometimes you don't know what you're doing. You just like, you just get in there and you're like, I'm just going to change, shake things up. Sometimes you get very, like for the style of painting I do, like I'll start um, doing like really kind of free form brush strokes. Sometimes you'll get obsessed with texture. Sometimes uh, you start getting really close. Like you feel like you're going somewhere and then you take a, take a break and then you come back with that very directorial mind that you're kind of describing. Mm. I mean, it, this like where, where I'll sit down and I'm like, where do I want this thing to go? Cause it could go, you know, in, or in a lot of times there's like a deletion going on, like, because, you know, I don't, I don't do a portraiture, but, you know, I'll, I'll paint stuff where there's, you know, a lot of competing potential focal points and you'll start stripping away. I mean, I think the way you're thinking about this feels very similar to at least what's going on in my mind when I'm painting. So I feel like that's a, an interesting yeah, I mean, advantage. I'm, I'm I'm trying to model it after I'm trying to teach it to, you know, I'm trying to teach it creativity. So I'm trying to, the only way I know to be creative is how creative I am. So half these algorithms are something I watch myself do, or I see my kids do like that one that, you know, it's yeah. called, I call it horror vacuum. It's like, if there's an empty space, how do you solve that? Put something in it. What do you put? I don't know. Go to one of your other algorithms to find that, but put something there. Um, and what's what, what's fascinating is those those are the lower level ones. I, we haven't even gone into the deep learning. You know, the deep learning. Yeah, is that's what I was curious about. Was like because I had a theory of how your stuff worked when I first saw it. But... Oh, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> well, so or, or, one of the things that I thought is is that you would um, sort of you, you take a subject matter and then you know how you know you, you you've got style transfer. So I would. And if you think about an artist, you know, like from an era or from a movement, they have like, you know, like anywhere from a handful to 20, 30, 40, maybe different influences. So I'm kind of imagining like, you know, a, a style that evolves that's in essence, like within your favorites world at, you know, at any point in time. And then you take that, um, that rendering is going to take your 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 subject. So let's let's take you know. A, a yeah, you're right on, by the way. So far, okay. Go on. So then, say so you take like a, a subject, and then now you got to like render it. So I don't know for 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 just for our audience's simplicity. Let's say you know you got like a ton of cubist Picasso y stuff going on. Um, so right. now now you've got the image itself that you're trying to like. This is like the the like um, kind of concept of where the artist wants to get to. It's this thing. And that thing doesn't probably change too much. Now you go off and you start making strokes and you're, you're probably like, like I would think that you're trying to like minimize different, like do the stuff that you're saying, which makes it quote interesting. But at the same time, you're trying to like minimize differences between that a priori kind of conceived 
target that you're trying to get to. Like in this case, like that, you know, like that, that cubisty kind of style thing, yeah. or whatever, whatever that style may be. Um, is that anywhere close? Yeah, to no, totally. I mean, like down to the cubist. Uh, so here, let me, let me, let me, like, it's almost everything. Okay. So the first, you know, when I first learned about deep learning, it was like, uh, was it five years ago? Maybe I, I, I never get, uh, sometimes I say I did something sometime and I'm off by a couple of years, but when I first learned about deep learning, I'll date it for you. It was right when AlphaGo uh, beat Lisa Dahl at Go. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And I started reading the articles and the articles and I've done, you know, I'd done AI and I'd done, I'd done like, you know, uh, neural networks, but then I started reading. So I was like, some of the moves were creative. And of course, I was yeah. I was interested in making creative. Uh, and I was like, "What do you mean creative?" And everyone was like, "No, it's not a gimmick this time. These are actually creative moves." And I started looking into it, and I was like, "I I, I became convinced." I made my first deep learning algorithms were style transfer, uh, and uh, and I started messing around with it, and I was like, "You know what? There's something here." And the first paintings, and and these paintings got uh, you know like got a lot of attention were um, were Picasso. I, I took a I can't pronounce it right. The one with the five prostitutes. I fed that in and I was like making these gorgeous paintings. I was like, portraits. And I was like, and the portraits look like Picasso's. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like how, you know, I've, I've, I've gotten this creative part, but like the, the robots lack style. If you can steal Picasso's style, um, you know, what is anyone but a conglomeration of all the artists they loved before them? So exactly like you were saying, I, I got Picasso, I got Cezanne, I got Van Gogh, I got Degas. And I started using those to make uh, style transfers, but it always irritated me that I didn't want to be a Picasso knockoff, you know? Uh, yeah. So I would start mixing the style transfers together. You know, I'd run a Picasso, then a Degas, and then a Cezanne, and, and the robot would paint them. And then I found this cool thing to do is like you can, the robot can paint, begin painting a Picasso, then halfway through, I could switch the style transfer to a Degas, or actually more interesting, a Cezanne. And uh, and it would be this conglomeration where I was painting like Picasso for a little bit and then started painting like Cezanne. And um, and it became interesting, it became its own thing. Um, so I did that for a while. And then and then it got more, this is, that was simple deep learning. And then it got more to, I was like, you know what, even though it's like, what if, it, what if it started learning from itself? And so I started like making, this is thousands. I've made, I painted thousands of, thousands of portraits is a big exaggeration. I oh, painted so you started feeding its own yeah, output, exactly. you got it. actual paintings like back in as things to style transfer to. Yep, huh. you nailed it. That's it. I mean, and, like, and then it started developing its own style, which is what you see behind, well, what you can see when you look at my art. I would say at this point, I've painted about 2000 portraits over the last 15 years. I'd say at this point, a good, a majority of the work that it's using as inspiration in, in, its, uh, in the neural networks that it builds is its own work. But what is its I mean, own that's work? That's fascinating. So like, how do you, so, okay. Like so far this feels like, you know, if, I don't know if I was like, a, you know, like a, a, the next Picasso picker and I had to see like, and, and sort of look at like, you know, the, the thing that would work. I mean, it does make sense. Like an evolving painter has influences. Oftentimes those influences are actual paintings. Although, you know, I'm sure there's certainly other influences that come in like photography, music, poetry, all kinds of stuff. But let's just say for now, they're looking at painting. So they get attracted to a certain set of painters. Then they just start painting. They start evolving you know, into something that somebody else on the outside calls a genre or something eventually. Then they start seeing works of their own or elements of works of their own that worked in the past. And they start yes. learning lessons from it. Like maybe the exactly. way an eye popped or maybe the way they had a little painterly sort of thing going on around a lip or a nose or, you know, or whatever. And then, but they have to like, like, it's not so conscious, right? Like, you yeah. know, when, 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 when you're an actual artist, you don't sit around and think like this, but I'm- No, you don't? I was well, wondering about that. With your painting, don't you have like a favorite painting of yours? And you're like, wow, I want to paint something like different, but I really like what I did with that painting. I guess what I would, yes, I do do that. And sometimes I do it very overtly. Like, I'm just going to blatantly try to like, paint like a master for like a particular master for a while just as an exercise mm. but other times and so that would be like like very uh conscious and you know like energy directed uh modes of forcing your style or something but then there's like all this other stuff like much more subtle stuff that you 
don't really think about, which is like, I don't know, you go on a traveling trip, you just wander through museums. You know, like one of my favorite museums is the Modern Art Museum in Madrid. And I just, something, you know, will stick in my head forever. Like there's an Anselm mm. Kiefer piece that, you know, I remember standing in front of for like an hour and a half or something, two hours. Mm. And like those things just are sort of a combination of serendipity, life experience. Like, I mean, I barely even wound up in that museum. You know, it was like we were on a trip and somehow, and my wife's like, yeah, you know, you might like the third floor. There's like a bunch of abstract expressionist stuff. You're kind of into that, check it out. And then I, you know, like, where did deep go? You disappeared for like hours on it. <laughs> and like, so it feels like getting back to the bot though, I'm curious, like, how do you make that determination of what the bot chooses to like and how it chooses to like it and then how it chooses to incorporate it into its own style. Mm. Uh, That's my, you know, ultimately that's me. It doesn't know when it's made a good work. Right. Mm -hmm. So ultimately it's me picking from my favorites is like, wow, this worked great. This worked great. This worked great. And then I'm I'm making the data sets that, that I feed into it. And, um, and it's, it's kind of cool because it's coming up with a look. There's definitely a look. And, and I, I didn't realize this till my, you know, to, when I was young, I wish I'd, I, it's taking me so hard to figure art out. And I still am like, not even like scratching the surface, but I wish I realized this past is like, it seems like, you know, most successful artists have a look. You, you, yeah. you know, like you can look at a Picasso and, and you can know it's a Picasso immediately, even if you've never seen that Picasso before. Same with every, so, you know, and, and I, I, I sometimes wonder, it's like, you know, is everyone is, this is I'm going to go on a quick sidetrack here is it's almost as if an artist comes up with a generative process to make their own vision that they hone over years and they get very good at this generative process and they make painting after painting after painting like it and 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 the public loves it because it's a style that's been honed it's a very beautiful style and it's a recognizable style and and it's like in the last couple of years the robot's gone down that road it's like, since I keep on feeding it its own work, its new work looks like its own work. I'm, I'm sorry, it's old work. And, and this is appealing to a lot of people. A lot of people have told me, it's like, you know, I love it. I saw this painting come out. I knew immediately it was autonomous um, and you. And, and, and so that's, that's interesting because, you know, it's made me really question, you know, the, there's a whole genre of generative art. Um, and the genre of generative art is art made with rules, but some randomness. So, you know, when you, and it, it could be a computer program that makes generative art, or it could be someone hangs um, a paintbrush from a tree and then lets a paintbrush uh, swing in the wind. Mm-hmm. Doesn't have to be a program, you know, that's generative yeah. art. Um, but it's like, I begin to wonder, you know, I, I started applying this idea of generative art and I realized that a lot of the great artists were simply generative artists, but instead of using a computer to execute their algorithm, they're using their brains to execute their algorithms. I think of artists like Pollock. Yeah. You know, Pollock yeah. used to drip white paint. Yeah. Then when the white paint was done, he did an even, evenly across the canvas. He would go get the black paint and he would drip, drip that evenly across the canvas. Then he switched back to the white painting, just all the time, making sure it was even. That just feels like generative art to me. But yeah, no one it's really almost classifies like, him as generative yeah, like they, artist. Yeah, like, you know, Pollock's a good example because it's, you know, there's like the, the sequencing, but just the very drip thing is clearly him. The, and then the, you know, painting horizontally, like hunched over with the canvas yeah. on the ground. Like yeah. a lot of it is kind of like maybe even, I, you know, he, I don't know the exact story of how he got so obsessed with the drip, but um, clearly, you know, great artist finds a path to walk down, it feels like. And the path is sort of um, unique uh, to them and and they keep walking down. They might have a few paths, you know, like there's different eras in a, in a, in a master's life. You know, you can look at, you know, there's definitely like the non-cubist aspects of Picasso's life, for example. Um, one, huh. so I kind of want to switch gears a little bit and then maybe we can come back and stitch it together, but I want to make sure that that we get a chance to like hear about the robot itself. Like, mm. tell me about the, the hardware. Like, you know, do you build the arms? Do you, are you buying some arms? Like, tell me about the brushes, like just, just, just the actual hardware. I, uh, the re- I, I'll tell you about the hardware of the robots. Uh, the first is that, you know, like the reason I don't like to name the robots is um, uh, first off, whenever someone names a robot, it's always a bad pun. Like, you know, Picasso bot or, or there's actually a Pollock bot I've seen, you know, or, or, or whatever. And, or 
and and also it's it's falsely attributing an identity to something that's a machine which is a tool so I, I i avoid it and also the other reason is right now I'm, i always call my my system autonomous but i have four different robots running it right now my software works on many different robots to tell you about them when i started it was it was um xy tables and um and it would take a brush and i would just like uh pick up a brush and, and dip the brush in paint and the xy table would be basically something i went to xy coordinates connected the dots and then simply a solenoid which is a magnet that would lift and drop a brush that's it so go to an xy coordinate lift and drop a brush if it was a paint well it would drop the brush into the paint it would lift it back up then it would go and draw lines connect the dots uh and it was in the whole system back in the day was connect the dots and paint by numbers mm-hmm. you know i'd give it shapes and i would say fill in the shape connect these lines really simple uh no ai even in the very first stuff the very first stuff it was a printer Yep. Um, but as I got more and more successful and lucky, I, I realized that um, whether or not the, the code's identical for, for the XY tables and my robot arms, because there's a lot of inverse kinematics where someone has done all the math to turn your, your robotic arm into, you know, you just give it XY coordinates. It'll move to those XY coordinates. Yeah. Um, and Z, in the case of robot arm Z. So first I got, I got some donations from 7Bot. They were these small robot arms that were like, you know, had about a, a foot reach. Okay. And then those are, I had three of those and I started messing around with those, but I needed to be longer. So I would actually put those on, um, I'd put an XY table on the canvas or on them so they could move around and paint. And, and it wasn't that I liked them better than the XY tables. It was, it was that people did not, it, half of my art is a performance art, right? Mm-hmm. And they don't respond to uh, XY tables as much as they respond to robot arms. Robot arms are just so much more visually entertaining and interesting. Um, I've, I've had both at shows, a robot arm next to a table. And I've had people, and I've had when the robot arm's off and the XY table's painting, I've had people say, what's the difference between this and a 3D printer? And, and Yeah, and yeah, they're... conceptually it's way less exciting. Uh, yeah right yeah, like, it looks like that. a 3d printer They're like it's a 3d printer what, what, what am i and so so i've gone the way of um robot arms um because of the audience to please the audience well but also if i had my if i was making these in the cave what's that and they're also quite powerful like these arms that you can buy off the shelf now are um i mean i mean you know it's everything from putting a rocket together to like you know to 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 hold the brush yeah uh, i mean you don't need to kind of reinvent that that whole part of it i, I imagine tell me a little bit about the how you think about the brush because like when i think about a brush i think about a bunch of them and then i also think about palette knives and i also think about whatever random craps in my studio that i grab and start using like, yeah good point you know, like god knows what it is and then, uh, and then, and then, then you know, there's like the paint mixing and like all that. Like, how much of that are you like thinking about in the context of the bot? Because I noticed, like, uh, it seems like a lot of the, um, you know, the, at least the videos that I saw on the site, which I encourage our listeners to go um, check out for sure. Because you're only getting this in audio if you actually see it. It's a whole other thing. But you know, I think there were like a handful of brushes, and there was like, it was kind of like a like a drippier consistency of paint and then yeah. it dips and then it goes in paints. And so tell me, yeah. tell me how you think about that. Right. I'll take one step back and I'll go right into that. So the arms, you're right. You know, the arms are better, not just because of uh, the X, Y, two. the arms are, can handle palette knives. They're mm-hmm. much more agile with the brush. If you imagine a, a 3d printer holding a, a brush and go up and down and, and, and draw lines next and Y, but when you get to the arm, you can do swoops. You can do, uh, you can take a palette knife and make like, you know, some very, very specific drawings. And so, so that is one advantage. I just, I just, um, uh, I just have always been challenged and here's where I got a weakness. And I've seen other, I've seen other artists like uh, and so other, even other robots do a little better. Um, I have a hard time handling and managing paint. Um, one thing I do, and it's kind of my signature look, is most people, they do paint horizontally when they're dealing with robots. I like to paint at a 45 degree angle because I, I like to paint with really liquid paints. And every once in a while, too much get paint gets put on a place and starts dripping. And that looks like, uh, you know, some street art. And it, it's like a mistake. And and, it, and the more the more abstract and mistaken my, my um, machine's, the paintings look, the less robotic it looks, the less it looks like it was printed by a printer 
Well, those mistakes friend. are also what artists crave. I mean, you know, like yeah. artists are craving mistakes. You know, you're you're aggressively doing stuff. I mean, you know, I'm always spinning the canvas around, trying things upside <laughs> down, trying things, you know, and then uh, yeah, I mean, like those mistakes are what you want. I mean, like unless you're doing kind of absolute perfect realism, you know, but I feel like that's even realist painters don't really do that much that yeah. as much anymore because so huh. Yeah, and it gets even cooler with that. It's like not only are the mistakes what we want, is like, you know, I was, you know, we were talking earlier about it's taking pictures constantly. Like, what should I do next? Um, if it has a, a priority or, or it's trying to get to an image and all of a sudden drips appear somewhere, that really throws it for a loop. And all of a sudden it, it has like, it's not executing. It, it's just like, it's getting feedback. The feedback is it did some, ex it executed some commands but the commands aren't executing the way it was thought it would be executed. So the visual feedback it's getting puts it into another direction. And I love that serendipity because that's the, um, because it's not a false, it's not a fake randomness. You know, a lot of these generative systems, I, I couldn't, all randomness is fake, but a lot of generative art systems, they introduce randomness to get variety and variation. This one, it's not introducing any randomness to get variation. Uh, the physical world is introducing it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so then and it has to react and it, it has to, and I think that's so cool. No, that, that's, a, um, that's a really essential part of it because when you see the pieces, you see that right away. Because, I mean, you could imagine like putting that into your original, you know, upfront digital rendering of what the thing is trying to paint. You could imagine yeah. it just putting in drips, but then it's trying to like paint a priori conceived drips like it just feels fake yeah. somehow you know like artists would never do that artists wouldn't be like i'm gonna put a drip in there and like i mean they might they might when they're kind of in that like less analytical mindset where they just start you know but i don't i don't think they would like conceive of a, a painting at that level of granularity of technique manifestations otherwise it starts to feel formulaic or artistic, yeah yeah or, yeah or like, like you know it's artisanal like or something yeah, it just, I don't know. I, yeah, and, and what's interesting, and, and you nailed it, it's like, um, nailed it earlier, actually, is um, sometimes I walk by the painting and the drips look so cool. I just want to stop. But of yeah. course, you know, like the drips have, like in one painting, a drip has gone over the eye and one of the algorithms, one, I, have a, I have a lot of algorithms that really focus on the eye because yeah, yeah, the eye is essential to portraiture. So I have a lot of algorithms that treat the air. It finds the eye and treats the area around the eye differently than it paints, treats the rest of the painting. So if a drip goes over the eye, you know, an alarm flag goes off. It's like that eye looks messed up. But sometimes I love it because the emotional, this is where I, I'll interfere with the, with the canvas. There's something emotional in a painting where the eye gets covered. It's like, you know, it's just like the eyes are the windows to our soul. So if you have someone- Oh, yeah. Yeah. half their face the eye is smeared that is that is an evocative emotional portrait the robot has no idea it just made an evocative emotional portrait but it just messed up with the eye and you mess with the eye you're messing with the person's soul and you're making a much more interesting portrait than if you're not uh yeah no i i i i, I was thinking that when you were describing those 24 kind of um rules or or objectives if you will because i i was thinking about um for every one of the ones you would say, I could think of some, an example painting or artist or something that would intentionally do that. <laughs> yeah, no, then that's where I step in. And yeah, and then I've even thought to myself, I was like, huh, should I, you know, I've even had, had this occur and I was like, it's so cool when one eye gets messed up, should I like have some pseudo logic in there? Another module that says, if one eye is messed up, turn off the eye correction, you know, like just say, no, it's good. You know, we got some, we got something emotional going on. But that's where I really fail is I really can't find a way, obviously, because if I did, you know, I'd have a, a person, I'd have a, I can't find a way to add the emotional element. That's always comes back to me. I, I, I don't, and I try constantly to like measure paintings, you know, with like have some you, kind of like, um, like um, emotional index. Have you ever or, thought about just like leveraging some, some crowds to like, give you some of that emotional metric and then training up some models to in essence assess the emotions on let's say various axes yeah um, i don't like, know you know like you can think of like 
I can think of them a number of attributes. There's like kind of the the realistic on one side, uncanny valley, like contorted on the other. You know, like one on one extreme, you know, you've got you know Francis Bacon, like where things are like yeah, there it couldn't be any more crazy and distorted. Which emotionally, like you could you, you could imagine building a you know a system pretty straightforwardly, just running some Turk experiments, feeding some images, engaging some emotional responses from them, training up some models, and then applying it here. Perhaps you're not sure whether AI can really transform your business. Maybe you don't know what it means to inject AI into your business. Maybe you need some help actually building models. Check us out at zionix.com. That's xyonix.com. Maybe we can help. So one thing I wanted to ask you about is um, I for for years one of my I don't know if I would call it a pet peeve, but one of my like observations of industrial arms is they have mastered one type of of movement of humans, which is, I would sort of describe it like when you're maybe three years old learning how to write the English alphabet or an alphabet. At that age, you know, you draw like very slow Mm. and carefully. But, you know, after you've learned to write for, you know, a while, you know, we follow this much more ballistic motion where it's just like quick, you know, fast, you know, Mm. uh, movements. And I don't really, there has to be some industrial bots out there that, you know, focus on, on ballistic movements, but I'm curious if you've thought about the role of that in art. You're right. And I, and I like how you put that. You're right. It's like, uh, it is mechanic, but it's almost intentional. So I've held myself back in this place, in this, in this regard. And I'll tell you what I'm in. I'll tell you how I've held myself back and I'll tell you what I was interested in. I've held myself back and like, you'll see a lot of my work. One of the signature things is this cross hatching. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like these very straight brush strokes. And, and that appeals to me because first of all, you know, you know, all these artists are always looking for a signature look. So it's one of the signature things you'll find on my paintings. And if you look at the art, you'll always see very straight brush strokes in uh, at 45 degrees. And the reason why I think this is fascinating gets people's imagination is when they see these paintings, they're like, oh, look, this is hand painted, but. But feels machine or- Yeah, this artist has really straight lines. Yeah. And, and they're perfectly 45 degrees and it's kind of does this cool thing. And I love that effect. I like and the honesty of that. Like that feels really honest to me. It's like, it's like I can do something that humans can't. I shouldn't go out of my way to like <laughs> yeah, fake straight lines, you know? But then, you know, I, but I've also always tried to like think about how could I improve this stroke to be more human? And I've lots of tests. And one of the things that's just so hard is like in you is painter to painter is like, you don't realize you do some of these movements until you really study it. Like if you're drawing, if you have your brush, for example, and there's any painter is going to say, oh my gosh, I do that. Or if you haven't noticed you do that, you're going to notice next time is when you're drawing a very straight line and you got your brush and your brush is wet with paint, you are ever so slightly spinning the brush between your fingers to keep oh, that. Oh yeah, brush. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, for to sure. Keep it nice yeah. and sharp. You're like almost yeah. spinning the brush very subtly. I'm talking like a degree every, you know, like a degree a second almost just to keep the head of that brush really sharp. And a lot's going on there. Your eye is watching that brush, watching how the line's getting laid down. A lot's going on there that the robot is not doing. A ro- my robots cannot do. You know, they would have to have a camera. They'd have to have feedback. They'd have to see how well the brush was going down, how straight the line was. They'd have to look at the, the, uh, the, the shape of the, the brush head. All of those, so much skill that's just missed out on the by the robot that a robot arm should be able to do but it can't do that'd be an extra spinning axis and and a lot of feedback yeah i mean it feels and, almost like you know like the, similarly with like an actual you know like with a with a human artist you know you've got your toolbox you know not like a literal toolbox but like you've got your toolbox of techniques independent that evolve right so like you know, there's, there's plenty of painters who maybe, you know, never really spent much time with the palette knife, then they start mastering it, they start getting into it. And maybe at some point, they're just painting with the palette knife. You know, there's, there's like, um, you know, there's, there's, there's folks that, you know, use a lot of mixed media, they start, you know, maybe have a lot of drawing elements or something, they start integrating that. There's others who maybe never done a portrait before. And they, they've just done like cityscapes or something. And now all of a sudden, they start adding the ability to draw, um, you know, from portraiture vantage, which causes them to pull in some more tooling, like, you know, figuring out face proportions, you know, nicely figuring out how to deal with a nose, which is, you know, every portraiture's nightmare. 
portrait, portrait, portrait paintings, painters' nightmares. So <laughs> I'm curious, like how you how do you divide your time between giving you know the robot more technique and like another tool in its toolbox, if you will, like a palette knife That's or an understanding of something, versus like you know continuing to um, you know use what it has, but maybe focused on different subject matter or, or other stuff. Yeah, that's good. That's, you know, I, I, whenever I make, I make changes, there's usually in leaps and it's always, there's like 10 things I really want to do. Like I want to make, I want it, it to start changing brushes, but that's like, you know, I, when things are going good and, and the pins are coming out good and, I, and I'm pleased with the direction, uh, I just keep on doing it. I, you know, let it, let, let's keep on going deeper and deeper and deeper into this. But then every so often I, I challenge myself, there'll be some kind of show and someone will ask me to do something better. Um, like for example, I, I'm doing a collaboration with uh, Anne Spalter, uh, an artist uh, on the East Coast. And, um, and, she, and we're doing this collaboration where we wanna really find a style between ours, but doing a style between ours means I have to get very high res images of a time-lapse of the robot while it's painting. Right now it's always taking photos of what it's doing, right? Yeah. But I, I don't give much attention to those photos being uh, color correct. I just want to know that they're the color is approximate and and that the and so like right now I'm doing this big and in, in, I'm doing this big change where I'm trying to get the studio and get the lighting perfect. And um, I wouldn't have done that unless I had the challenge of like doing a collaboration with Ann Spalter. And in for some reason you would think doing lighting is easy, but you know when it comes to machine vision, every time I change the lighting so I get good pictures. I screw up one of my algorithms. My algorithm gets too sensitive and starts seeing too much content or whatever. It just, it's a very sensitive system. Um, so it's usually a fun project I'm doing with someone inspires me to improve it a little. Um, trying to think of some others. I have, I have a, another project where I'm, I'm working with the children's hospital and the children's hospital. The kids are so demanding. They, they want, they, they can take a tablet and paint alongside with the robot and the robot will, uh, will mimic what the kids are doing. But the kids, you know, they have all these, they, they, they just, you know, they have their imaginations is awesome. And they keep on asking for a big, big improvements, which I, I'm trying to keep up with them. And, and the improvements will be like, I want to be able to draw a thin line and a dark line. They want to, you know, mix colors better. And, and, and so that's pushing some development. But um, I don't know, I guess I rambled a little, but I, I don't know when and why I improve stuff. It's usually from external forces. Yeah, um, or a big project. It kind of made me think, like when you were describing your collaboration, it it sort of made me think of printmakers. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with like printmakers, like lithographers, or you know other type of prints. But you know historically, like uh, you know the printmaker from the the craft side, uh, or I shouldn't say that, um, but like the the like when they're not acting like the 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 artist, but they're in collaboration with an artist. So like, you know, like a, a Ken Tyler collaborating with a Picasso to put together a piece, the, you know, the print the printmaking side, it's not like just a laser printer and a poster. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's very like a very intensive, high, high skilled process for them to collaborate and like work with the artist to realize a vision. I'm almost mm. curious, like, do you see it? Like, what's the future of what you're working on? Cause it feels like one potential future that it feels like you're mostly doing is you're like, you know, the printmaker who's not working with an external artist, but actually doing their own work and, you know, just happens to like run a, a set of, you know, nine or, ten, you know, or 10 or however big their edition size is. But there's another side where, you know, some, some printmakers are less focused on the, on their art and their personal art and more on the like enabling no. of the artist side. I'm wondering if there's like a worldview of the robots that's similar because it's not like if you're not really into this, I don't think you would get very far, you know, with a system as complex as yours as, a, as an artist, like if all you care about is the art. But I'm curious if you see maybe an emerging world that way. Um, yeah, there, there are so many answers. There's so many answers. A lot of things you're saying is with the collaborations. It's interesting because you know, there's been some very famous artists that have gone in touch with me and they want to collaborate. And, but I, I quickly realized that um, they don't really want to collaborate with me. They want to use my robot as their printer. And, and it gets mm. into these awkward situations where all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, I see what you're trying to do, but that's not really a collaboration. You know, that's, you're trying to use my printer, my robot as a printer. And, um, and it always gets to this awkward situation for me because, 
I mean, call it my artist ego. I don't want to be someone else's printer. You know, yeah, like yeah, I, I yeah. want, if you're going to collaborate with me, I'll paint with you and we'll come up with something that, you know, we both work on, but it's not going to be your art painted by my machine. Um, and so I, so it's, it's, it's almost this, but like when I have really good collaborations, like the one I'm really enjoying with Ann Spalter right now, it's more of like, Hey, I really dig your style. You like mine. Um, let's try and find a way that someone looks at it and does a double take and say, wait a minute, is this a, a Pindar Van Armen or an Ann Spalter? Cause I see a little of each in there. Yeah. Um, that's the ultimate collaboration. Uh, and, and so like, you know, when I, when I, approach it that's interesting like i didn't even think about that from a printmaker because you know sometimes the big artists like a picasso going in with a printmaker i'm sure they would want the printmaker maybe not uh, to be anonymous you know and a technician some of them do yeah i mean like my, my wife was a printmaker for years and you know I mean, nothing gets her goat more than somebody's you know calling a poster a print you know like and you get all of her <laughs> friends together and they just lose their shit completely but like um but but yeah, I mean some some do like you know she's you know she's she's printed a few you know like worked with Chihuly for example the prints oh, wow. and, and you know in those cases it's very much like you know the big name artist wants to do their thing but I think I don't know the details like but I'm pretty sure they always have the the, the studio the print studio is always on there and ah. um, and and most printmakers like similar I guess to like glass blowers are like this too but there's there's the part where they're enabling somebody else. But then that same artist has their own work and there's some kind of like wall where they'll do both, you know, usually because they need to pay the bills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like, and, um, and so they, so yeah, if somebody thinks of it as using your bots as a printer, then, you know, the printmaker would just be like, you know, piss off, I'm not going to do that. But if it's, yeah. uh, if they're thinking, but the reality is like, at least with respect to printmaking is that the collaboration part is not really optional. Like it, to do it well requires the two to stand in the room together, to stand at the layer level, to like have feet, you know, to like really work closely um, to construct the piece. And maybe, you know, the artist, like the, the actual master or artist or whoever isn't there the whole time, but it's very much, I think if it's done well, it's almost always properly seen as a collaboration, but it's not quite the collaboration that you're describing, um, you know, where it's, it's, that's like, you know, like a, like a true, uh, I don't know, 50, yeah. 50 if you will. Those are the ones I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely, and, and, you know, and this is, this is what I've learned, like everything, I, this is like what I've learned. I just did a piece called uh, collaboration with past, present and future. Um, I realized that, you know, I'm collaborating with every artist in my data set, you mm -hmm. know, like, you know, if I have my, say, I mentioned earlier, Cezanne, Picasso, and um, they got, you know, I'm collaborating with them and their work. I'm collaborating with um, all the art, all the code that I've, I've swiped. You know, that's an interesting uh, I, way to look at it. Yes, like the algorithm itself is collaborating when you're doing style transfer. Yeah. You know, when you're when you're like taking multiple seed images and like, for sure. Yeah. And then there's like different levels of collaboration. Now I'm almost thinking you use your robots in conjunction with another artist to do a, a collaboration piece, and now you take that and put it back into the bot for future work. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, it ends up being really cool to see like where those lines are. And even and even like, you know, like I go into GitHub and I grab half my deep learning algorithms from there and I, I, I you know, I make them mine and, and I, I modify them and I make them like I tune them to my stuff. But man, I'm, I'm collaborating with the the uh, the engineer that came up with that deep learning, you know, with that neural network. For sure. You know? Yeah. Um, and then and then what would be the fun? And then, of course, I'm collaborating with the robot going back and forth, seeing how it's doing and it coming back to me. And then here's the, here's the other one I realized. Just this is this is outside of robotics. I realized that also every portrait I do is a very very intimate collaboration with with the subject. The subject will make or break a portrait. How open they are, how much how honest they are, how how much they cooperate. And and like you know, especially I found out in COVID times, a lot of these portraits. I'm very very strict about the sources of where, where I get my portraits. I won't paint other photographers' portraits, for example. Even, you know, if someone comes up to me and says, oh, I had this professionally photograph photographed, I own all the rights to this photo. i am like, yeah, but you know what? The, the, the photographer that came to your house or, or met you took those photos and, and I don't feel comfortable taking his vision. You know, we have to get our own photos. And um, if we're gonna work from photos- so how, from how do you do that? Yeah, how do you choose subject matter? And do you, do you always work from photos and do you shoot them? And like, how does that? 
how do you, how I do you try and shoot them. Uh-huh. I can't always shoot them. I'm, I'm, you know, I act a little high on uh, my high and mighty and on this high horses. I can't always shoot the photos. Um, so, but I definitely make sure that if someone's taking an artistic photo of someone, that's off limits, you know. But if someone's taking a headshot, a professional photo, and I, I might use that as part of my GAN, but I don't want to paint a headshot. That's boring, right? Yeah. But, you know, I definitely don't, I don't mind using a bunch of, this is interesting. You haven't even made me, I haven't thought about it too much detail. I, I love, you know, if someone wants a distorted face, I love getting like 10 of their photos together and throwing their photos into a, a GAN oh. and, and have some tricks that, you know, GANs typically need thousands of, of images, but there's some tricks where you can get around with just using 10, you know, you can like, uh, and they're actually interesting tricks. You know, you flip them, you rotate them a little, yeah, you, you 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 can you can make a good data set out of just a couple dozen photos. Uh, and the other thing is, I have like you know, I have all these online galleries where I, I like have the instructions. Is like here are the instructions. I need you to take a photo of yourself, or have a friend take a photo of you straight on, and then from like ten different angles. And and I'll have like you know, and, and I just I just wait for people to get me a lot of images. And once I have a lot of images, I can run with it. Um, I I always love the idea of building a photo booth. And having someone like in the photo booth, I haven't done this, but like this is how I describe it. I want, I want a bunch of photos of you making different faces from different angles, from different lighting. And then I'll, I'll throw it into my AI and my AI will do something with it. Cool. Um, and, and then that's, that's the, and then the other thing I do is I collaborate with, um, with portrait photographers. And so there's a very, very good uh, portrait photographer. I love her art, uh, Kitty Simpson. And, and um, if you go to autonomous, uh, autonomo.us, you'll see my collaborative work with her. And, and I just try and get my robot to paint her photos as emotionally as possible with as much. And then she gives me feedback and we change the algorithm. And I have a whole separate algorithm just to deal with, with her photography. Uh, it's so beautiful. So, oh, cool. and, and, and people on the, people on listening to this can't, uh, can't see it, but you can you can see it, uh, Dave. It's the pictures behind me on the left, and like I said, you'll see them on autonomo.us. Awesome. So, all right. Well, I I want to. Um, I think we're out of time here. Uh, it's been it's been totally um, awesome talking and uh, and just catching up on your work. I mean, it's 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 just oh, it's super exciting for me. You know, just uh, being a machine learning guy and then, and also being you know into painting for for a while. So, thanks so uh-huh. much for coming on. Ain't no problem. It's been great. That is all for this episode of Your AI Injection. As always, thanks for tuning in. You can find more about Pinder's work and his creative process at cloudpainter.com. That's C-L-O-U-D-P-A-I-N-T-E-R.com. That's all for this episode. I'm Deep Dylan, your host, saying check back soon for your next AI injection. In the meantime, if you need help injecting AI into your business, reach out to us at zionix.com. That's X-Y-O-N-I-X.com. Whether it's text, audio, video, or other business data, we help all kinds of organizations like yours automatically find and operationalize transformative insights. 